Okay, so it's 10 o'clock, so I think we should just do the schedule and we'll be starting <coughs> this track on uh, learning analytics. So, first of all, good morning to every one of you. I hope you, you had some a wonderful evening uh, yesterday. <coughs> and I see that we're not so much late as we should. So, <coughs> okay, so just a brief introduction. You know, this year uh, we call the the, track, the title of the track was the end of the beginning because year after year this is the seventh year of the track. Um, we're seeing uh, different uh, studies, mostly focused on prediction uh, using data mining techniques, and I think we have uh, matured quite quite a bit in this. Uh, Eight years, not just the seven uh, from the conference, but also uh, from the learning analytics and knowledge conference in 2011. And we think it's time to move forward and do some new things regarding uh, learning analytics. That's why we just not only for traditional uh, learning analytics studies, but also for new approaches, some of which uh, we will be seeing today. And also we'll be unveiling how to uh, move forward with our studies. Uh, in the future, from some questions that we will be uh, discussing later and after the coffee break. As you know, we have a time allowance of uh, five minutes uh, for each presentation, just a contextual, brief contextual uh, presentation of what we have done, so that everybody gets like a glance of what each of us has been uh, working on uh, and presenting today. Uh, just Uh, this is very important for us to give us a starting point for discussion. Uh, at this point, there's still more potential than, than actual evidence that uh, what we are doing is really working. I mean, all, all the things we do allow allows, allows us to explain what we have done in the past, that learning analytics should be oriented uh, towards the future. So we'll see how our different uh, research papers can move forward. Uh, okay, so that's uh, the logical step there. And we're stopping here because I have five great topics of uh, discussion for later on after the coffee break, but uh, I don't want to take any more time from you, so we'll just start in the uh, presentation of the different papers. So, we're not okay. so the first <coughs> study is Making Teaching and Learning Visible How Can Learning Designs Be Represented by the Kaido Rodriguez? Learning framework of teaching and learning activities, and occasional adaptation. 
than to explore this framework, to help help this framework can assist teachers to share and adopt great teaching ideas. The idea, one of the ideas of learning and the, and the design is to represent what we are going to do as teachers and for them to share. And I, I would say not to share among teachers, but also to communicate to students, to communicate to other uh, stakeholders involved. Uh, a more classical and maybe technical definition can be of what is learning design can be found in the tech wiki that describes focus more on the learning objectives, learning activities, process, but I like to see learning activities in a, in a broader way, or sorry, learning design in a broader way. For me, learning design is, of course, formalized learning design, process definition, but also the lesson class that are developed by teachers, and also the educational guides that we have to create at the beginning of the course to show to our students what we are going to do. So, in this context, how can we represent, or in which ways are these learning designs represented? Well, we did the, I did this research, and finally, all the results I found are summarized in this table. One of the ways, of the more common ways to represent a learning design is narrative test. That's a test for description of what we plan to do. Okay, this is a way. Uh, we, some, in some cases, there are, some people also do video representations, but this is not important. And then we have other more formal representations that are templates, table representations, and visualizations, the diagrams, different kinds of diagrams. I'm going to show you all of them different types. This is a typical template or form where we have several uh, areas to describe the, the uh, to provide a narrative in the, the overview, the topics, and also the people roles, the activities. Okay, it's a more organized way than the pre-test of description. In the uh, left side of the screen we have this, is, uh, this was a typical learning design of the tool. That is, a lot of forms of computer forms where we have to input data. For me, if, if you don't know about learning design, you can see here how <coughs> difficult it would be for a teacher to understand what is going to happen in order to view in this kind of interface. Well, there are other interfaces from similar to this form representation that are more tabular representations with, with more uh, maybe structured glosses. This was another kind of representations, one from Canada, Canada, Visa Mod, represents uh, learning the, the, the science of lesson plans as a kind of concept map where different concepts are included and relations among concepts. Uh, it's very difficult to see anything there, or another kind of concept map, learning goals that are related one to, to other. We have here LAMS. LAMS was a kind of learning design often to uh, very popular, and they described the learning designs as a, a typical flowchart, more or less. So it's something very common for engineers, but not maybe for teachers. These are other kinds of representations. These are the typical three lanes where we have the different actors and the actions they have to perform. And these have been simplified in these models of the, the, our AUTC or in the Compendium LB to represent and can have been quite successful. But I like a lot this kind of representation that is also uh, uh, a sequential diagram. It's more recent, it's from two or three years ago, from a, a representation. And here, the three lengths are in horizontal, not vertical. We have the teacher activities in the top, the student activities in the bottom part, and the duration of the activities. So this is more uh, useful for teachers, they can understand the better. We have other kinds of representations, like for example, in Valladolid, this two college that are more <coughs> adult. I go to the conclusions because we don't have many time, but as conclusions, I think uh, there are different graphical representations for learning design. I mean, they are not used in using learning learning. New concepts are possible, as I have shown in this slide tonight. And I, I would say they are here. Um, 
Of course, I think that these visualizations can be useful for the learning analytics point of view. Okay, thank you very much. I think. Thank you. So, uh, the next presentation is uh, the paper titled Prediction of Academic Success Through Interaction with Resident Control Systems by Ethel Manerke and the Rewalt Together. Uh, 
this is, we don't uh, focus on the accuracy we get in the test space in the previous space, uh, but we uh, make, <coughs> we evaluate each uh, model with a different data set in order to ensure the, the generalization of the models. We consider typical uh, K performance indicators, such as the accuracy, and for the most promising models, we compute the precision, the recall, and the F1 score, all coming from the from the confusion matrix. Here you have some results. We can talk later about the result. There is a poster, so you can uh, in the coffee break, so you can show more about the, the results then. And just regarding the conclusions, regarding the first question, uh, results show us that there are uh, features uh, in the students' interaction with conversion control system related with the academic success. We have uh, even provided a prediction model uh, by evaluating several alternatives, which allows to obtain uh, the probability of students to pass uh, or fail the course before the exam or before the, they have to, to fulfill the task. This uh, identifying such students we allow, will allow teachers to to carry out some strategy in order to help them to pass exams uh, uh, or things like that. Regarding the contributions, we have two specific ones. We have a public website, all that is available to so use it. We also have a method that we think that can be used for different types of problems. We have developed a, a, a software tool which implements this method. And the work in progress uh, has to do with improving our data set by adding uh, more specific features. And we are also refactoring the tool in order to release it in a Open source uh, license. And um, this is it, so we will put a Thank you very much. Our next presentation is uh, Evolution of Decision Tree Classifiers in Embedded Personal Data Mining by Katani Toivonen and Ilka Jormanen. Yeah. Did yeah. I say it correctly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Actually, the presentation is titled just something else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the title of the paper uh, is, is the something to do with the decision trees. My name is Ilka Jokman, I'm coming from the University of Eastern Finland, and uh, this <laughs> work is joined between me and uh, my PhD student, Tapai Toivonen. Uh, so, I, I sent this presentation to the wider frame of, 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 of our contribution of augmented intelligence in educational data mining. So I, I try to open what we, what we actually mean by that. And the particular paper that we appears in the proceedings is kind of part of that a subject or a particular study uh, on this topic. So you might have heard the term augmented intelligence <coughs> in some other contexts. So it refers to this study or practice where the human perception of a subject matter is, is improved and enhanced by using the intelligent things like uh, wearable devices or, or, or even like uh, artificial uh, bodies and, and, and that kind of things. And we, we really stole the term actually from the proponent of one journal reviewer. Uh, we had one particular article submitted in, in a journal and one of the reviewers suggested uh, this particular open intelligence term to use also in this context and then it was it sounded so so great that uh, we, we adopted that. Thanks for the more her. Um, so we we try to introduce this method of open intelligence in educational data mining context. And the idea is that instead of having the traditional educational data mining or learning analytics system where the users or some, somebody, the domain expert, the software developer, data scientist, creates a, let's say, predictive model. Uh, and then the, the, the model is incorporated in a learning system and it outputs something which the end users use as, as, as they use. We try to uh, get the, actually, the end user more tightly into the process and, 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 and turn this black box. Uh, data mining or learning analytics model into the white, white box. And uh, here the human agent in this uh, diagram uh, uh, 
uh, usually refer in our group it refers to the end user. So in educational context, in learning analytics context, it's usually the term or the end of also a student. And the idea is that uh, we should build a system that allows the data sets to be kind of manipulated or categorized, labeled, trained uh, by the end user. So that the end user would have the means to uh, train the white box uh, machine learning algorithms of Texas and Chris are one of the examples of those. As you can see from the paper, they are quite easy to understand and integrate even by the, by the uh, uh, agents that or users that are not uh, experts in, in data science or, or, or data mining. Well, the idea is that the <coughs> model or the algorithm outputs some model which can be classified or cluster or, or, or predictive model. And uh, the model is used as part of the system. But instead of being happy and using the system, the user actually can modify again uh, the, the model. The user can, for example, add more data into the model kind of on the fly basis or the user can modify the output the uh, model, for example, decision tree, and change the, let's say, viral values of the, of the nodes into something more meaningful. And so the cycle goes on. And uh, what we see is that uh, the cycle affects both the human perception of the, of the model as well as to the, how the model or how the algorithm uh, perceive uh, the, the current data set. And the, and the output is uh, very contextual uh, domain knowledge. So well, this was the kind of overview, and what we are in particular interested in is, is that what, how, how do we can build uh, meaningful, easy to use uh, visualizations of tools, how they are easy to interpret by the, by the human agents, the end users, and also very interesting uh, kind of topic here is to study that what is the role of subjective understanding of the context and should that be more important uh, factor when evaluating uh, the models than the traditional uh, accuracy uh, measures. And eventually if this process leads to more contextual knowledge discovery process that is uh, more, more, more meaningful uh, for the end users. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so the next paper is today on MWDEX, a Moodle Workshop Data Structure, and it's uh, by Emiliana Finalatale, Santiago Iglesias Prada, Angela Gómez de la Sierra, and Elsa Pelaez, and Isabel Provera. So, that's it. Okay, so first of all, thank you trying to stop it, actually, but I cannot see the window. <coughs> so, uh, let me begin with uh, one question, just forget about this for a moment. How many of you are using some kind of uh, peer assessment in your courses? <coughs> okay, uh, how many of you are using Moodle to assess, uh, to perform the peer assessment? Okay, um, I guess then you might be using either uh, the forum module or the database module or uh, probably more frequently the uh, workshop one that allows, uh, if you're not using it, it's the most, most powerful module in, in Moodle to perform that kind of peer assessment. So uh, this research is focused on, it's focused on uh, solving a problem that we do have when we do peer assessment using Moodle, yeah, and more specifically Moodle workshop. It's a very powerful uh, tool, but it doesn't allow you to export uh, a 
as simple as that. You, everything's presented on screen, uh, but you, can, you cannot just get all the marks, all the grades, especially if you have some kind of rubric with different aspects of the rubric and also some uh, feedback, written feedback by students to other students. So we had this problem. Uh, uh, here we try to solve it, and you might think, well, how does this relate to learning analytics anyway? So there's something in learning analytics we're mostly focused in, in our research on performing this kind of algorithms to uh, uh, detect or to predict uh, student performance, to reduce the have early warning uh, uh, systems, but there are not so many tools for, uh, like, for like standard data extraction and processing. So we think that this might be part of, uh, of the in initial process of uh, learning analytics, uh, where we extract the data and then uh, pre-process it in order to later on fit some learning analytics system. So because we don't have much time, uh, I'm going to show you this video and I hope uh, I'm asking one thing from you and it's if you know anybody who uses the Moodle workshop uh, module, uh, just tell me because we're trying desperately to find users to see whether or not they have the same problem as, as, as us. Uh, we want to expand this, I mean this is just for internal use so far, we're trying to uh, put it on the institutional uh, Moodle for other, um, for other teachers to use it but we need some feedback from actual users who encountered the same problem in order uh, to persuade our uh, management to include this. The, th the good thing is that it's not a plugin, so uh, it doesn't have, have, have the hassle of uh, some security validation. It's all implemented uh, using the Moodle, uh, a Moodle web service. And what I'm going to show you is just how fast you can uh, create and implement it. It's, an it's actually an application, a web application developed in Node.js uh, uh, that connects to the Moodle web service that you have to activate. Um, when you validate, you can export everything, be it on an Excel uh, file or a JSON uh, file that you can use later to create other uh, learning analytics systems. So, I forgot to mention it's uh, open source already. In our repository, I can give you the URL. So, I guess you just download the, the code. We have here the URL of our Moodle uh, instance. Once it downloads, but you see here we're starting. We have our server, but this is on localhost because we're launching the uh, application in localhost. Adding the service and then listening at port 3000 usual. And the application is just simple as this. You validate with your login credentials in your Moodle platform with the number of the web, web service. Then you have a different courses that you have over there. The different workshops, the list of users in the workshop. Here we uh, just download the Excel file. 20 seconds, okay. This was with around 35, so take some processing. And give it a five. One, okay. And in this case, when you open it, you see who has uh, reviewed the <coughs> task of whom, then who has been assessed. The uh, total grade, the grade of each different aspect, also the feedback, and whether or not you had self-assessment. So you can use those uh, data later for any uh, research purposes. That uh, that would be it. That's my five minutes. Well, thank you very much. Okay. So uh, the next presentation is. Uh, uh, JDBR Security and Confidentiality Compliance and uh, Learning Management Systems, a Problem Analysis and Engineering Solution Proposal by Daniel Amofilvan, Mark Aguirre, Francisco José de Arcia Peñalbo, David Fonseca, Maria Casas. Uh, can we go PowerPoint? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what?
to oppose to the treatment of personal information. And he has the right to say, I don't want this information to be used anymore. And this will cause a lot of problems. We have been dealing, we have been thinking about this problem for three years. We started thinking about blockchain because why not? And we found out that blockchain is, doesn't work for that. So well, we, we found out something and we published it. Blockchain doesn't work for this. We don't know if it works for something else, but this is not uh, from the in terms of blockchain. But now we have uh, we have studied the, the how an LMS works. And uh, first we find out something really interesting that's, is that students can, can see all the personal info information of his peers by design of the learning management system. Because otherwise you can have forum, you can do peer review, and now you have a student that can uh, enter and see information about uh, the other students. We have another paper we will, we will publish uh, next month in Moodle with Global, uh, where we have developed a plugin so a student that has problems and issues with privacy and confidentiality can have uh, an alias inside the campus. And uh, the, private, the, the privacy officer can activate this, and we hope that Moodle is going to incorporate it very soon in your uh, virtual campuses. But uh, we are going to talk so, uh, something else, it's, which is the problem of leakage of information. When we have an organization, you have a lot of people that has access to the service, to the backups, and the information is there. It's completely unencrypted. So the information, uh, the personal information is there, and the Daniel thought about what he calls the double authentication problem. You, we have a student, a teacher, a professor, an administrator that comes into the the, to the campus and says, I want to access this information. And the, campus, and the, and the system is going to block if you are able to access this information or not. But an administrator that is accessing to the database or to the logs, the uh, learning analysis <coughs> searches or something like that, is going to be able to access all the information. So what does the, uh, Daniel has done is just simply go nuts, uh, invent the access matrix that we have in the, the operating system for a lot of for a lot of time. They invent it again, and what we we have done is this crazy thing when where we I think it's uh, uh, what we do it's cipher the personal information of the students inside the database. It's it's, it's a crazy thing because it has developed it inside uh, MySQL. So uh, if you want to uh, the, the the table of the the students is, is encrypted, and when Moodle access is there, uh, SQL asks back is the user authenticated. So you will block if the if the server is hacked, the information is not going to leak. And we know that there's like a, a Moodle being hacked every day uh, worldwide. So this is a problem. So we don't want this to happen. So what we have to do is. Uh, we have the code available and we're going to test it. It's a little crazy, but I think the important, important is this fact that we have a lot of valuable information and people are, are out to get this information and we are, it's just laying around in backups and tables and file systems. And that's it. Thank you. And the next presentation is of uh, the paper like on data analysis for the prediction and correction of students. Well, and Same methods, same everything. One of them is me. 
the other one is Noemi de Argo there. And after we have this data, then we need models. We also have models, I will show you later which ones are those. And uh, after applying these models, we need to know if they are useful <coughs> for predicting these world learning strategies. Uh, at this point, we also have that. Uh, these models are useful, and now we also have applied some uh, actions uh, from the teachers to the students. And for that part, that we have done this year, the first time we tied up this year, uh, we have found two problems. One of them is uh, if you predict something and you want to do some actions, what you need is time. So the predictions should be done with enough time for these actions to be useful. If you predict the day before the final exam, it's going to be nothing. So we could sort that, more or less. And the second problem we had is uh, the students that are not uh, studying well uh, for any reason. Most of them, what happens is that they are not motivated with the, with the subject. So the problem there is that uh, they didn't, so some of them didn't want to come to see the teachers. So we were successful, but uh, I would say 50%. The problem we have now is that uh, how can we make these students uh, be motivated with the, with the subject, or at least to, to attend these requirements from the teachers. So, I mean, that is the, the, the main topic of the presentation, so I'm going to go fast now. <coughs> Motivation, I, I talked about it a little bit. So, we use two subjects, one of them is art and globalization. Data is there. The problem with this subject is that all the contents are more or less subjective. So, it is not easy to find the data there. We use some graphics. The other one is applied computing. This is my subject. So in this case, we could find a method for acquiring a lot of data from autonomous learning of the students. So here we could use some artificial intelligence algorithms. In alpha globalization, for example, we only could do this, this thing. So what we have there is uh, these uh, red dots are a peer review of students who use uh, rabbit and they evaluated the work of their partners. The, the blue triangles there are the final scores. So we could see some correlations and we could fix <coughs> different criteria here. So if we use this criteria, for example, all the students with a peer review below this line were called by the teacher. And what happened in the following year is that the students that were called, this is another year, were those ones, only these ones with this uh, green cycle, attended the teacher requirement, and actually their scores were higher. So our actions were useful here. But the problem is that only half of them attended. In applied computing, we use random forest, a prediction there. Okay, I'm uh, Very different uh, method. So in this case, where we have 20 students, where which were false positives. So these students, uh, we think on the algorithm, thought that they, they could have problem, but they didn't at the end. So these are the students that studied the very last moment, so we cannot detect that. And uh, the last year, we, we found 25 students that could have problems. I tried to talk to them, uh, just to finish. I only could talk to 8 or 10. The other ones didn't want to go to see me. And these 10 students, of course, we detected problems, and their performance were better at the end. But as I said, our problem here is that uh, we can detect easily students that can have problems. The problem that we have <laughs> is that we, we cannot uh, find a way to, to motivate them. 
So this is the next step. Maybe for next year, I will find a solution. So okay, I think that's it. So because uh, I think that uh, Los Palmino is uh, now then we are now heading toward the last presentation. Uh, we will be uh, analyzing the students' learning within a container-based virtual laboratory for cybersecurity by a panel of the Commission of Software and Data Factor Roberto Hernandez and Reto Campos. Uh, the grades are in the exploratory study, and the grades are 
little bit better. And we have uh, we have um, uh, we have checked uh, the access on, or, or some resources uh, like all contents, and we are now uh, submitting more, more resources. Uh, we have checked some some parameters like addresses, time, and number of sessions. Uh, we can now uh, we think that. Uh, <coughs> For establish the, the laboratory locally, it's, a bit, uh, it's not so easy for a student, but uh, once a student has, has installed uh, or have the Docker Compose and, and the Archester, it's, it's much easier for them. Uh, about the student acceptance, uh, all the results uh, uh, in this exploratory study are better except the initial effort of the students. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's <laughs> caffeinated right now, so that should be better. Uh, we start here, and now we're back again uh, to the discussion. We already know uh, different studies that all of us have been conducting. So, uh, I mean, we can do this freely from the different topics that have uh, uh, been raised in the, in the presentations. We can feel free uh, to talk about anything related to the, uh, to the studies and also to ask some questions to any of the presenters. Uh, if there's any question, we could start there. If not, I, I have like five uh, main topics of discussion. Uh, Mark, I think that you will be interested mostly in the fifth one, so that's the last one. So what about the fifth one? It's about uh, privacy, ethics, and security. So, uh, do we have any particular questions for any presenter? Yes, so. Well, I had a, a question about the, the augmented intelligence, because, because uh, I was afraid that maybe we should also talk about biased intelligence because with all of these uh, mechanisms that you described, maybe we are going to do this to introduce a lot of bias in, in our own perception. So I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, what, what kind of biases you are specifically referring to? This? Um, the what we have noticed uh, when we have been working and we're using this method with the teachers and then uh, making them to access the models and then uh, the iterative process, it leads to very context specific uh, let's say classifiers. And, and then and, uh, they are most likely working um, in quite, quite nicely in a particular situation. But not necessarily uh, in similar kind of let's say classroom setting with another teacher. Because also the teachers have the personal preferences on what, what, what they see the valuable in a certain uh, learning context. And uh, if, if the kind of adjustment or augmentation is taken too far in a way, so then it might might be classifier or give it the model that uh, that really doesn't generalize at all. But, but it works very well in, in a particular situation. I was I was thinking about it since you since you tap on the you, you give feedback, you alter the perception of the individual. And we are all already all really biased. For example, I was thinking about the experiment of the Gorilla Lab, uh, where there's this video when you there's a there, there guy is passing uh, basketball to teams white and, and they tell you look count how many times the white team passes the ball and you are, and you count the times you count the times and then you said and did you see the gorilla and there was a gorilla there uh, pumping his chest and you didn't see it so it, and so we are already biased as an individual that uh, that we put a system on top of our perception that is altering our perception, this is going through a filter. And, and that's, that's my concern about uh, the, the introducing more bias in, uh, 
in ourselves because we are choosing what we want, what we want to see, and we're making ourselves more blind, even more blind to, to, to our world. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and, and uh, um, perhaps, um, I mean, yeah, it might be the case, especially if the, if the context is, uh, is, is kind of general and, and, uh, and there are plenty of things that the, the, the end user can do uh, through this organization. Uh, but I don't know if, it's, if the context is, is kind of limited. That's a very specific case, like we had uh, this uh, uh, classroom or this, this kind of maker uh, space uh, experiment where the teacher, teacher uh, we, we call it some data and then let the teacher to use the school. Uh, and then the context was very limited and very specific. So there, uh, this augmentation process led to. Led to uh, Better perception, better understanding, and then that was that was done done kind of uh, retrospective. So, so it was done after the, the class actual classroom or the uh, activity took place. So it might be different if, if the process is done real time or if it's done done um, after, after the class. I I think so. That's what you said. Better perception. What well, is more accurate perception of some things that you have pre-selected and then you're blind completely to other things that you are ch you have chosen not to see because our bandwidth is limited. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. have to be really careful when yeah. you put into the system. Because like when you have these terminator glasses to see a world and you only see what the system is telling you that it's there and you are completely blind to everything else. And this is also embedded in how we perceive the world. When you are paying attention to some things, you, you are blinded. But now we are putting this in the technology that we are going to wear. So it's, it, it, it's something to, to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Let me just uh, get in there because uh, among the five great topics that uh, I, I was proposing as part of the discussion, I think this one addresses completely this discussion, but it also involves the works of, <coughs> of other presenters here. Uh, because, as Mark said, uh, yeah, uh, you introduce more bias by uh, putting a human, let's say the teacher, in the middle of the process of filtering and such. But there's a prior bias to that in how we select, for example, the features uh, that we're going to introduce in our educational data <coughs> uh, algorithm. So, I would like to ask all of you who have used some kind of uh, educational data mining uh, technique because and, uh, first to think about uh, what's the instructional or the educational research logic behind this choice of uh, those features or just I selected all features I have in, uh, in my data set because that's uh, reasonable but perhaps there's no logic in selecting just everything for the sake of having everything and introducing it so what's the uh, rational behind your choice of parameters to introduce in, in your uh, algorithm and also <clears throat> how it helps <clears throat> actually to uh, inform uh, teachers or students uh, to improve their uh, whether the satisfaction in, in overall the process of learning because let's not forget that learning analytics it's not educational data mining educational data mining is on the algorithms uh, data analysis, but learning analytics is using those data or something useful and it's improving and optimizing the learning process. So, uh, some of you have used different algorithms. So, please go ahead. Uh, well, I want to tell you more. So, coming from the field, I am a physicist, and at the very beginning, uh, well, my PhD is in physics. So we, we were always uh, having questions similar to that. So some physicists want to know the origin of everything and why the things are in one way or another. And that is uh, different than, for example, a point of view of an engineer that maybe wants something to work well. So it is 
not always, I mean, if this works, it is okay. I maybe don't know the origin of the universe of everything, but it works. Well, for example, uh, when you do an exam in, from physics, then you have to learn a lot of formulas and equations and demonstrate everything. If you do the same in an engineer career, maybe sometimes you have a table with data and you take from that table the information. Okay. So my parameter here is this one. You don't know why, but the table works. So here, something similar happens. We, maybe we want to know the origin of everything. We want to know why this parameter demonstrates some education, why this parameter is useful. But sometimes you also need something to work even if you don't know why. So I think these two things can coexist well. I can make a model with a black box saying, okay, I can make a prediction and I can be useful for my students. And I put there all the data. And what is the parameter that makes a difference? Well, maybe I don't care, because it is useful for the students. At the same time, we can make models, of course, and we can maybe different researchers can try to say, okay, I want to understand. I don't see a problem if these two worlds coexist and cooperate. So there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with doing something without completely understanding what's happening. As long as it is useful, at least. Uh, I completely agree with you. So I think that uh, the parameters that we have, have, we have to take into account is uh, how to process the data that we collect. So these are key decisions that should be guided by the education of the year. Because uh, at the end, uh, processing data that is about learning, about the learning process, it has an increasing, increasing difficulty, let's say, and then this, this is that, that learning is something that happens inside of our head. This is something that we can, or, or somebody else, so this is something that we cannot test, that we cannot measure. It's not something that we can physically measure. We can measure the behavior. We can measure learning. So then, what is the relationship between the behavior of people and the learning that is inside their head? That's that's something that uh, that's a huge step that we can only cross thanks to the theory. And then we need to this theory to guide us in these decisions. So otherwise, that's we will be like like blind, you know, like blind. So. But uh, is that bad? I mean, I don't know the origin of my prediction, but the prediction works. So shouldn't I do it because I don't know the origin? Well, so the prediction works. Well, let's assume that the prediction may work for this specific context in this specific situation. Of course. Okay. And now we define what it what you mean by works. Yeah. So then, then that's another. Uh, this is why I say let's assume that it works. But then you change the student. There is, so the following year, then there is another class. Will it work? In our case, it worked. <laughs> so okay. let's assume that, 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 that we change the teacher. Let's assume that we change something. So let, of course, in every experiment, you have variables, and you have to control the variables, and you have to validate the experiment, saying, OK, it is valid in this context. So you define the context and you say, in this context, with these variables and these fixed values, it works. So of course, you cannot say it will work here and in Mars and in another dimension. But in the context, in the specific context, it works and it makes the function. The function um, it works, really. So uh, I don't know the origin, but year after year, I apply the algorithm and it helps me to detect the students that can have a problem, so I can call them. But I don't know the origin of this uh, information, but still I can use it. Maybe it's only me. Maybe it's my whole university, or maybe it's uh, some specific alias. I don't know. But you define. You define perfectly, but as perfect as you can, as in every other experiment. So you define it, and it works in that context. Okay. Okay. You don't know the origin, so but when you use it. Okay. I, I, now we have more I, 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 so I, I like very much uh, what you said. Uh, and the, the point here is that uh, physics 
is a really singular science because uh, in physics you can make a theory and you can test it and, and you can verify it. And so we, we have an actual science. And most of the other sciences are not like physics. And what we have in here is uh, always the platonic argument. We have a theory, we have a model of learning of what learning is about. We don't know shit about what learning is about. We don't have a model of what consciousness is, is and constantly all the social studies the constant in social studies is that usually they are not replicable. You will have a theory, and then this theory, people believe in this theory, and sometimes people have to publish, and we publish, and we, okay, we take selectively the data, and then when we've tried to, to say, okay, this is this really working, we see that a lot of our theories don't work. A lot of, so we think we know some things, but then we have this bias. I have one learning theory that is going to enforce how I look at this data and I will look at the data that enforces my theory of learning and there is going to be another school of the theory of learning that is going to, and, and I agree with you, sir, we have a problem here, let's use what's, what we know that is working for fact because otherwise, the other thing is we are building theories and, we, uh, and, and they are really uh, comforting. It's, it's, it's good for we have a theory, so we have a, a story, and we find, uh, we look for a story, and it's going to make us feel comfortable. Medicine 200 years ago it was about the equilibrium of the humors in the body. And I'm sure in, in uh, 50 years, what we're doing right now in medicine is going to be barbaric, uh, considered as barbaric, so, because we don't know it. We are, we are want to, you want to apply theories of learning that are less than 50 years old. And are constantly being disproven, and, and as uh, we start to learn more about the brain, and we say, oh, it's not working like this. But it makes us comfortable. It, it makes us comfortable. And then there's the other problem that we are all here in the learning analytics. We want to analyze 100 students, what are they, 100 students doing? The problem, how you fix learning, is don't have 100 students for teacher. Let's come. 15, 20 students for teacher, and then the teacher can do something really amazing, which is talking to the students and asking them questions, and then you don't need learning learn analytics because you know your students and you know your shit. Okay, yeah. we, we also have one of nine in learning. Thanks, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, my point of view, what I see is that this is what we have to do as scientists, data scientists. We have data, we have information, we have knowledge. And we want to have understanding. So it's all part of the same thing. We have, of course, we have to apply the knowledge. We have, and we have tried to, we should try to get the understanding why this is happening. For me, putting a example of another discipline is like astronomy. 2,000 years ago, the people know that the moon has six cycles, but don't understand why <coughs> scientific development has us to get this understanding. But maybe, maybe the problem there is that I, I usually tend to focus on, uh, on the sentence, but it works, okay? Uh, but having it work, whatever, to be considered work, because it may be, uh, I may not be interested in increasing uh, the grades of my students, but rather that they are satisfied. Uh, and that would be a completely different goal and see how I measure that. Fine, but work in other people. Yeah, I think we have this objective. But do they find it? Regardless of that, um, saying that it works doesn't provide you any understanding. That's, uh, and there is where I think that learning theories, I mean, yeah, they're, they're not so uh, so often. They have been studies uh, and they have been rebutted in. Uh, in some instances, and they're not universal, but for example, uh, differences between uh, conception of, of how we create knowledge. Well, the, in constructivism, uh, lots of different uh, theories. But you have to use them somehow, uh, or we may use them to understand what's going on. Because if we don't, I think that if we don't understand things, you cannot really improve them. But that's what you know, I said that uh, this two approximations should coexist. So yeah. you should try to understand and discard. It doesn't mean that if you don't understand something, you should discard it. 
I mean, if you do not understand something completely, still you can use it. And of course, you should try to understand it. So, still working on understanding. But don't discard something because, okay, I don't understand that, I don't have a theory, so it doesn't mean anything, so I throw it away. Yeah, but like... <coughs> and, and, and the complementary argument is, if something doesn't fit with your understanding, don't discard it either, because it's there. Yeah, of course. And that's the problem, you have the model, and everything that doesn't fit in your model is, is just noise, it's error, it's routing errors, it's outliers. And, and the inform real, inform the real information going on in the outliers. But then my question from one dominion that said would be, I mean, uh, how do you get understanding from what you have been uh, doing? Uh, I mean, you give those models to a teacher, how does he or she get understanding? And Ilka has a different approach mm -hmm. that I would also like to introduce into discussion. The simplistic method, the make a theory and test the method, the theory against the... But you're not theory. testing any theory, you're just putting data in the, into the blender and see what well, comes out. Sometimes the, sometimes the theoretical uh, assumptions are not ex explicit in the... when, when somebody writes the paper or something, yeah. and sometimes implicit in the researcher's head, or in the one who designs the technology. So, Sometimes we are not conscious that we are using theory. And it defines yeah. your perception. <coughs> and your theory defines your perception. Yeah. And you're missing all the data. It's like something that's happening to all of us all the time. That. So, uh, like when you said uh, this, this, uh, this work, so, uh, like, for, like, you said that about physics. So, imagine that we are teaching uh, gravity or something like that, theories or, you know, or physics or something. And then you say, well, I'm going to predict whether my students are going to learn about uh, about uh, like this practical theories or whatever, and then you predict whether they learn or not. But then you are doing an assumption there. Before. This is a very subtle assumption that is that, that the learning process of your students will only be guided by learning this specific content. And maybe other people are doing other kind of uh, uh, assumption, and then they are looking at the social network be between the students. So. By looking at the social network of the students, and they are doing another assumption, and they are taking another kind of more dialogical theories of learning, or even they, if they are uh, assessing this debate and then seeing the idea of pop up, that will be a dialogical theory. So what I mean is that only in the in the in what you are looking for, then you are doing the assumption of what learning is. It was wait, 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 just, wait. Just, just, just wait, just wait, just wait, because, because we have some presenters I specifically addressed, and we haven't heard from them, so I'm sorry I can leave you to my train. Okay. Well, thank you very much, so thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, um, how, how we see and what it is and value is confrontation or hate. The, the, the idea that we, we put the paper for teachers to try to try to see where it is and where it is for this kind of white box proof is the fact like that we, we also, also see that uh, the, the journey is more important than the, than the result in a way that knowledge discovered about a type of learning process uh, uh, can be supported by, 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 by letting the teacher uh, to, let's say, play with data, to, to modify, to have a kind of exchange uh, between him or her and the, and, the, and the machine learning mode. And adjusting whether they are meaningful or, or, or let's say, rational or very informed adjustments, they somehow are always, of course, based on the teacher's perception or the, or the, the kind of context or knowledge of the situation. If the model, if the algorithm, let's say, is a decision tree that uh, from the uh, viewpoint of the, of the accuracy, if we just take the objective accuracy, uh, might be very good, but it doesn't make as a for the teacher. There, there might be some, some, some conditions that uh, are not uh, ever going to be implemented in the, in the, in the real classroom. So by letting the teacher to uh, modify and iterate the model, uh, 
you might lose some kind of objective uh, power. <coughs> Necessarily, it's not uh, uh, the most accurate one, but uh, it is hopefully most meaningful for the editors. In fact, in, in your studies, you search for the most accurate algorithm. In, in fact, it wasn't the same all the time, depending on the on the data. But in your case, the result was never the optimal mm -hmm. uh, result of the algorithm. So, here is that maybe we are being uh, too ambitious. I mean, uh, I think uh, to get a full understanding of the learning process is not, uh, not what we are doing now. I mean, we, are, we can define models which uh, give us an intuition uh, about, for example, our students are, are learning. I mean, we have models which help help us to say if our student if our students are working fine. I mean uh, if I detect a student which is not working fine I can call him. But uh, my I'm assuming that uh, working fine means learning. And we can see the student is cheating. So I think at the moment it's very difficult to uh, correlate uh, models with uh, an abstract uh, concept of learning. I don't know if you need to. I think my name is Samuel Mann. Well, I, I agree with you, and I have an example of another analytic. We did a research with well levels to try to detect if the students were stressed or if they did well or not. And this depends a lot on the person. The same vital things in different persons represent different things. So if this is for something that we can ensure in this way, imagine learning context, how difficult this can be. This depends a lot on, on, on the context on, on many things. Okay, well, I, well, I would say that uh, we can try to understand uh, learning analytics as a complementary way, uh, asking the students, asking the students about their satisfaction, the their satisfaction, and uh, try to corroborate uh, their opinion with the uh, conclusion that we do with our emails and in the part of prevention. And I think that is, it, would, it would be a way to try to start to understand the learning process, in my opinion. I'm going to tell a little story. It's about a classmate when I was studying uh, engineering, uh, computer science engineering. It's a six year degree, so it's time, six years. And this guy now is a high executive of a multinational uh, telecommunication and he's earning double of the person that is earning more money in the room. So just to make a context. During, uh, I was, uh, he don't know shit about informatics. He doesn't know nothing about mathematics, programming, databases, operating systems, artificial intelligence, he made the practices with me and uh, my wife, we were, we were a team. He didn't understand anything. He only knew how to cheat, how to copy in exams. He knew how to cry in exam revisions uh, really well. He uh, flirted with girls to best get the, uh, get the best lecture notes. He stole twice an, ex uh, an exam uh, uh, the, 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 the text of the, the exam, and he finished the, the, the courses in six years with us. So what's the moral of the story? The moral is that we can lay all the rubrics, we can lay all the tests, we can have all the theories, but we don't know what we what the student is learning. And what he learned in the in, in the in the in the in the college was how to steal, cheat cry, manipulate people, and it has been really successful in that in his life. Yeah, but those are just competencies. Yeah, it's competencies. So, right. so, 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 you have your theories of what's the solution to the future. And he, you put a test, the student passes the test, gives you information that has nothing to do in what's going on in his head, all the process that he has followed. But you have these things, and 
you're going to believe it. And if you look at his uh, uh, his academic level, you deserve, right? If you're looking for money, he's a good holder. Wait, 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 Some uh, important topics 
are being arised in the conversation or not. And you do that in, like in a large classroom, you only can do it by uh, doing some data analysis. I mean, if you don't have two groups, you would just talk to them and say, well, what have you learned? Or, or make them like create a wiki. But when we're talking about, let's say, online learning, and that would be another thing, whether learning analytics is suitable for face-to-face -face learning or not, or how it can help because we know the benefits in online learning. Uh, but, but for instance, in a wiki, when you have, uh, I was doing this for 15 years ago, in a, in a wiki, you can uh, assess the student not by looking at the final page, but by looking about the history. Yeah. And are you allowed to check, to check all the additions and, additions and deletions? By the student, yeah. Yeah? By the student, and, and with uh, and and the, the tools to get no. difference of every interaction and, no and you and you can see if a group has collaborated or existed simply but you're not case. doing it like how, how much time have you got to spend like more than the additional two minutes you get the thing you can spend two minutes for student please two two minutes of looking at at pages you get the gist of it imagine that you have lots of minor revisions that also Give you, I, I, give you information about whether student, whether whether uh, a student looks for perfection yeah. and is constantly trying to improve or not. I'm but pretty when, sure when that when you look at the thing, you get it. Two minutes for student, you get it. Can I can I Come get on. a little, a little bit of response that goes also to the other question? So uh, uh, one of uh, so a PhD student, uh, one of my PhD students, uh, he's uh, working in this uh, cross uh, platform cross. Uh, yeah, let's say cross platform uh, learning analytics for blended learning scenarios. Uh, in this case, it is not a uh, wiki, but it could be a wiki. So, as a, as a software dimension, let's say, and also a face to face dimension. Because then, the, in, the, in the group, can be different dynamics. So, it can be that people are typing, and each of them are typing, and so then you can see who, who did what. But it can also be the case that in a group of four people, they are discussing, yeah, and only one of them is typing. But it can also be the case that one is typing, one is thinking, the same one is thinking, and the other three are just totally missing. So then, the good thing here is to have, uh, what, what, what we are doing is to have uh, some microphones, and then the logs of the software. And then uh, we are, whether, and then we are uh, trying to see who is talking with whom, and at the same time, who is collaborating in the software level, and then he's trying to find a way to cross-validate all this information and translate all this information together. Uh, well, something that can be given to the teacher. And also you could have information about their faces, about whether they are agreeing or not. Or uh, well, no, no. It could have been also another dimension, but let's let's put two dimensions on right now. So then this is, this is what we're doing. One thing is that the, what I was doing to the week is really similar to what we saw that they were doing with the big, with, with the big comments. It's, it's the same thing. You could build a, a some analytics to it, you can do it by hand, I did it by hand, you can build a system. And did you this thing that you were doing with the Microsoft, uh, have you passed it through an ethical commission or something mm -hmm. like that? Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was hearing you, I think maybe this can be better because we, when we measure something, we force the students to work on this way. Maybe it's not the best one because I could think about an attachment. We have the 100 meters wave, and there are people that we try to look at that. But is that healthy? Maybe. Is that what we want for everybody? No? No? I mean, it's dangerous when you say we are going to wrap over the conversation. Well, as I have to say, we are not in the midst of the conversation. No, no, no. But when you. I just ask my students to work in a team. Maybe some of some one of them they don't speak too much, and the others talk a lot. But they are if they are working well as a group, I think that is the point. Mm -hmm. And in order to participate, each group depends uh, on a lot of things. If they feel comfortable. Maybe some some of them are more friendly, some of them are more uh, caution, But it depends on the on the group and the interaction among them. So, uh, being, um, yeah, well, but it can be also the case that uh, as a teacher you have some, a group that as a group works all right, but then there is one of the four people who is totally lost. Yes, and then you only find out this in the sum, but then you can't do anything else. Yes. So then, 
Yeah, but it's very Sorry? It's very complex. And there are many things. Of course, it is complex. So then, yeah. And uh, there are also other ways in which you can detect that. So it's a peer assessment, simply. Uh, I think yeah. putting a microphone and writing the conversations of the student is deeply troubling for me. Deeply troubling. No, but we are not Sorry, we are not But what are the, the good features of the people I know there are many different kinds of teams, many different kinds of couples. Uh, many different kinds of couples. Uh, many different kinds of couples. Uh, many different kinds of couples. The, the mind yeah. in the room is uh, changes already the behavior. If you know, at some, yes. at some point, when, you, you, know, at some point when, when you introduce so it, you end, you end up forgetting about it, but uh, but that's interesting because you said when, when I asked what features should we put into this black box, you said, well, everything we have, just because it works better if you have more data, then this idea would be adding more data, so it'd be good, right? Yeah, but no. it's, like, it's like in medicine, it's like if you take a, if you make a test that is going to be invasive, uh, it's going to change the results. If you, if you put a mic and you record and you put a camera in front of the people, now you, you're going to change the process. So it's not an analytics. But you're changing the process when you tell them how to work in the wiki, yeah. how, what, which are the tests that you're going to tell uh, to, uh, to uh, make them complete. So yeah. you're changing but, everything. But the problem is that these technologies can scale. These technologies can scale. One thing is one experiment that you do with, uh, with a couple of mics and a few students in a control environment. Oh, this is nice. What if this scales? Look at China, please. Um, okay, then the scalability this is out of the scope of this meeting. Yeah, but, 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 but this, is, this is the ethical discussion that you have before you do something. This is going to scale. What happens when we do this? If it's a success, when this scales? Because right now we have cameras and microphones in the classrooms in China. Well, that's well maybe I will have to leave this guy. Well, this guy is in India, so maybe he goes to India. When you put the focus on measuring running 100 meters, people does that. But this is what what we want. They, they are train for things. that, they train for that, they optimize for that, and they sort themselves about, about their ability to do exactly that. Yeah. And somebody that could be a great marathon runner, it's the, the last of the class. And he will be feeling bad about himself. Yeah. It's not worth yeah. mm -hmm. there, there was a recent study where, uh, you know, our learning strategies, and they detected some clustering. And one of those were people who tried a lot uh, to perform tests, right, until they got some correct <coughs> answer, and they were in the group of, of, of students who failed more, and that was because of instructional design, there was uh, a reward for completing uh, those tests, like it was one uh, point out of uh, five or ten, so that doesn't, I mean, the analysis would have told you on educational theory, uh, that those who are since they test more and have more tries, well, they end up being like uh, high with uh, students with higher academic performance. But it was not the case, and it was because of the instruction on the same. So, how do you, in your studies, how you combine uh, the effect of your instruction on the same? You all know your courses with uh, uh, with the analysis you do and the results you get. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, in the version uh, control systems, or in your case, access to remote labs. How, how does the, uh, the instructional design impact the data that you are putting into the model? I, I know it's a hard question, but, but at some point you decide you decide to use some uh, some tool. For example, in the case of the Git repository, what's the rationale behind? Using that and and also to apply the analysis to those data. It, it, it has to do with what you said about uh, an embedding. Uh, I try uh, in my experiments not to be uh, very basic, but I think you can avoid it. Uh, I mean, if it's very basic to use a microphone, if you use a Git repository, if you see a few slides. But there is something that we can there. In order to to look for a for a general for a generalization, we try to use the same 
tools that they are using in other, in other, in other cycles. I mean, why Git in our case? Because they were using Git in previous courses, and I didn't want to make them use anything different because I have, I don't have results, but I have the intuition. I think that results change, uh, change a lot if you change the, the tools or the way they have to do. Because you know something about the process. You know that in coding, it's better coder, the one that does a lot of testing, a lot of compiling. And when you do a lot of testing and a lot of compiling, you get versions that you want to save because you can revert to. And then you do more Git comics. And that theory about what makes a better coder has designed your experiment in line with what he that's, says. That's why I was saying so you give him maybe <laughs> more arguments. My, my, my scope is not so ambitious. Right? I think I can focus in a <coughs> with a wiki or with a, with a Git repository. I think the assumption, because it's, it's, it is an assumption, it's not a fact, that learning is related with, with a good managing and working with, with a Git or with a wiki. It's, it, it's quite really good. Okay. I, can, I assume that, and I think I can, it's true in most cases. Yeah, but that not not that, that, that would be kind of intuition. I mean, it's contrarian to the yeah. scientific method where, that, that, where you have some that theories that you say that you want to test. Uh, it's very <laughs> no, but but that is clear. He uh, the the idea doing a lot of compiling and testing is good practice, and I'm going to measure if you do this freaking good practice or not. And if you don't do it, your results are going to be bad, and I know it for a fact. And I and may have excellent coders uh, who just get it on the, on the first or second uh, commit. So, is that just in, in the representations? Uh, they, do they glow in the dark? The students who make the work at the last, they are outliers in my model. Yeah. And they are, in the end, they learn. But they go, they fail the assumption that are working. It's, uh, in my case, I would say they are going to fail, and in the end, they, they learn. They have, well, I, I, I think they gave some numbers, I don't remember about them, but he told, do you know what I mean? He told something about those students who, in the end, in the last week, in the last few days, have been doing the job, and, and in the end, they, they made that job. No, but that is a good job. Yeah, yeah. Of future selection. I mean. I Sometimes when I was a student too. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you already knew how to do it. You just didn't have time because you said, well, these are the days that I'm going to do it. And maybe on that time you did the right process but in a compressed time. Yeah. It's not about the process, but the compressed time. Maybe somebody doesn't know how to do it and has to spend all the semester doing the thing, it has to learn more. Because not all the students come from the same level of, uh, level of competence. Those things go according to learning theories. We know that students that get uh, that organize and, and plan during the whole course tend to get better results. Is because, especially in self-regulated learning, because that's one basic the thing that you need to have. Uh, but in, if you see that they're not doing anything, and you can assume that either they're not going to do anything or they're going to do last-minute work, which will not work fine. And also, if you go back to early warning systems, in early warning system we're coming crazy right now in getting all the data that, uh, that we ca can to analyze everything and see whether I can improve uh, the accuracy of my algorithm one week before because, of course, if, if the course is two months and you make the prediction in, let's say, a month and a half, uh, that will be very accurate <coughs> but it's not working for intervention. When we already know that, for example, in online courses, 90% of the students who don't connect to the, who don't make any connection to the platform in the first week, uh, they have, they are very likely to end up not passing the course or abandoning. So, why are we getting so crazy to making these big models when we could just say, well, I'm not connected or not, and yes. and, and then act on that information. Uh, so that's that's well, my well, big question. Is you can sort the best students in the class by the order when they get into the class with the different online courses. It's so then why, why to make more complex? Yeah, just more the, first, the, the first one that gets and into the class gets an age, the last one gets into the class. Random forest and entries and... 
one of the aspects that, I mean, there was one, uh, one, one biology teacher in our university, and then, uh, he did something he called learning analytics. I don't know exactly what it was by the definition, but uh, he took the Moodle log data and, 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 and uh, analyzed the course and uh, made some, <coughs> some, you know, some, some sort of analysis based on the Moodle interaction data and the final grades. And then uh, kind of identified there the certain, uh, certain behavior patterns. And then uh, he applied that information to the next course, not by implementing any fancy early warning system, but actually having a student assistant to, to, to follow and uh, email those particular uh, students who were in, in danger. And what happened? Nothing. They didn't change their behavior at all. It didn't change anything. Yeah, but then you have that information and apply some learning theory to increase their motivation and put them back into the learning cycle. That, that's the whole idea of learning analytics. Yeah. It's not just saying, well, I can detect them. That's not useful at all. I, I mean, like we said in the coffee break, well, I've done my job. Uh, I try to contact them. Uh, well, it, it's their problem if they didn't do anything. No, that, that's not uh, the teacher's uh, objective. I mean, you have to put them back into the learning, like in the learning process. Yeah, but in, 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 even in self-regulated learning, you have to act like a guide. It's not only for contents. Perhaps it's also on how to pro study properly, okay? or how to get interest in the course. And I don't know that. That's uh, the thing. I think that we're always forgetting about how to use that information yes. to make it. Just think about this. What? what? Uh, in our case, uh, since our students are on distance, uh, it's not uh, it's the most relevant thing is to keep the quality of the course in terms of uh, keep a similar quality if uh, students uh, work essentially in, in class. For the reason we have to schedule them, uh, we, we are right, we like the students to give them all the, all the semester and we put uh, uh, all, uh, as much resources as we can, uh, the resources in, uh, in the case you know, of work, uh, remote laboratories. In some cases, uh, maybe we are invasive, but we can, we all, on, on the other hand, we want to add more invasive and for this reason, our last version of the laboratory, uh, uh, the Corte de Laboratory, it was installed locally for the students, and uh, each student do all the tasks uh, locally, and uh, we only tested the direct interaction with the platform in order to give uh, some, some freedom to students. You are a student. And uh, you're subjected to surveillance, uh, surveillance mechanism that fits, uh, that fits a learning analytic system. And someday the professor, the professor comes and gives you a special assignment to give you something to read. Uh, this is spooky. Uh, if learning analytics allows you to know that there's something rotten in Denmark, in Denmark, or, in Denmark or, or something burning in Catalonia, or that matter, but what do you do? You take a decision about what to do about the Latin thing in Denmark or the Berlin thing in Catalonia, you know? What you have to do is now you go to Denmark or to Catalonia to go to the student and ask questions. Because you know that there's something rotten, but you don't know exactly what is rotten and what is what are you going to do. If you want to do some action, the first thing that we always should do is now we know that there's something going on, I should talk to this group, to this person, ask questions. Now you can propose some action. Maybe you have the action decided in advance, but if the, the, the solution comes from the sky, from the sky net, it's not going to work. Yeah, it's, 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 actually, it's the same. I mean, the action is not, uh, well, sending an email to a student and say, you're doing it wrong, you should connect. But rather, what you, uh, you, need more what, information. What you would actually do in class. You see one student with a face like, I'm not getting this, and you would ask, is there something you don't understand? So, so in this case of learning so analytics, you wouldn't just add, but you would receive an alert and ask the student, are you having any problem right now? Uh, why haven't you connected? Uh, is there a problem, I don't know, at home, wherever? That can be the action. 
And also, a second, a second point, yeah, but that's an action, just getting more, trying to get more information. That would be a first no, but step. You, but you presented that as an action. You, you think you're in front of you have, no, no, it's... No, because that's an action. You, 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 but, no, but, no, but that, it's not any action. One action is you get an information that something... Uh, and you use it, mark, and you use it. Now, yeah. you need more information, and then you can decide the action. But if the, the automation is, we know that something going on, and now we have the solution that comes from the sky. Yeah? No, but of course you could say, well, I have seen that you have connected to the platform. Is there any problem? Yeah. That would be the action. Yeah, that could be the action, but that should be the action. It's, you need more information. Yeah, it's not like saying, well, you have to connect, because that that kind of enforcement yeah. doesn't work. And also related to what I said, uh, when you talk about self-regulated learning, uh, well, actually it doesn't work in all people. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some people yeah. who don't get the competence even though they can work in it, but they need another learning strategy, like someone getting them by the hand and putting them different deadlines. Yeah, I, I know that's not uh, perfect. But my, my last addition, and then I go. So, this step of, of uh, so there are two things. One is the awareness that, that you were talking about, the awareness system, and then the other one is the decision making support. These two steps are not the same. Sometimes as researchers we forget that that if you say a teacher that something is something is wrong, a teacher, a, 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 a policy maker, whoever, something is go, something weird is going on, but then the, the following question is okay. So what I do? What what shall I do? And then sometimes if they don't know what to do, then the situation is worse because because then they, they feel more uncomfortable and so on. So uh, when and then that's uh, I mean, in Estonia, I had the chance to present this ideas of learning analytics to people in the ministry, to quite, to quite big people in the ministry of, of the country, and then they were not interested at all in awareness systems. They were only interested in systems that could tell people what to do, yeah. like cybernetics or or suggestions of intervention. So when, when, what what I suggested them was great. If, if you find they were especially for, for high school mate, uh, um, high school uh, directors. So then, please find find somebody else, or the system could find somebody else who, who faced a similar problem a few a few years ago, and now they solve the problem. So that that's, that's only this, that, but that was a very good uh, idea for for them. But I think we are missing the point. In medicine, have to go. Doctors <laughs> like, use systems or using different systems to make that diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, depending on the mistakes you do, 
this one is maybe but no, 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 this is built in dashboards. The dashboard is going to light up a red light or a green light or a yellow light. And you, we can have an amazing discussion about what constitutes a red light, a green light, and what indications for why do we put it in the contents. But there's going to be something outside our discussion that we'll all only see the dashboard and the red light. And it's going to take it for granted. We are building technology that is going to be used for people that will not have this philosophical discussion that we have today. Okay, then we're we're failing, uh, but not only in, uh, from a learning perspective, because that's the same approach in businesses. And when you develop yeah. some kind of dashboard, in the dashboard you have some indicators, key performance indicators generally, and behind those there's some. Uh, the strategic objectives of the company and they have been really really well planned and you know that if the indicator is strong then some part of the process that you have identified because it's measured by the indicator is strong if we don't do that in uh, with a learning analytics dashboard then when do it we are doing it completely wrong and in great companies the life expectancy of fortune 500 companies is less than 30 years because they reach this volume when they guide by these indicators and they screw up and they die. It's not and that's the success that they yeah. have here. And that's, that's what we put it into education. That's actually out of the scope, but it's, uh, I mean, the lifetime is true, but the rational behind is not true, and we're, it, that's organizational behavior and economics, so that's not part of the discussion. Uh, I think it's time to finish this. Uh, we have the last session. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. If you want to discuss more, you can. <laughs> we have 25 minutes to the closing. No, well, we can do it. Uh, yeah, coffee. Coffee. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's been very productive, and I thank you all for your uh, presentations and your attendance. And I hope to see you all both uh, next last year Spain uh, in Valladolid and also next year on the track of learning analytics here.